Um, so let me just kind of give you a quick, uh, quick overview of what you're in store for today. We've got four speakers, Ryan, Chad, Lou, and Chi, who will tell you about four different problems and in different parts of the business. Um, before that, I want to tell you a little bit about machine learning at DoorDash generally. Um, so moving on to the next slide, um, we uh, DoorDash, uh, as you probably know, is a uh, a very ambitious and uh, diverse company. We, we cover a broad range of problems uh, where machine learning is, uh, is crucial to our operations. Uh, that ranges from classic sort of discovery problems like search and recommendations uh, to operating a real-time three-sided marketplace uh, to more physical operations, thinking about inventory and things like that. So a lot of diverse and varied aspects of the business where machine learning plays a crucial role. Uh, so I'm going to tell you that I'll break that down a little bit uh, and show you about a few of those different areas. So if we go on to the next slide, um, and for each area, uh, there's a bunch I could say. I wanted to kind of highlight and kind of whet your appetite with a few snippets of interesting posts uh, from our blog that go into some of the more technical details of interesting problems we're working on. Um, so feel free to follow up on our blog after if you want to learn more. And some of these, of course, you'll be learning about today. Uh, so to start off, um, uh, if we just go back to that previous slide for a second. Um, so uh, one broad area, as you might imagine, thinking about our merchants and our consumers, uh, we focus on a lot of, like I said, search and recommendation problems, as well as thinking about the uh, assortment and selection of merchants uh, on the platform, um, doing a lot of, lot of interesting work in those areas. Uh, the other side, the other big side that some of you might be thinking about when you think of DoorDash is the three-sided marketplace that we operate. What I mean by three-sided is we have uh, customers, we have merchants, and we have our dashers who do the deliveries between them. So a lot of interesting uh, complexity in making that marketplace run efficiently, balancing supply and demand, um, optimizing how we dispatch dashers to pick up different orders, uh, as well as being able to predict uh, preparation and travel times. Uh, going on to some of the other uh, areas we cover, uh, I mentioned new verticals, uh, the team that I lead. Uh, so we think about retail stores, things like grocery and convenience stores. We're actually understanding uh, the real-time state of inventory in stores is very important, helping dashers navigate the stores um, as well. Uh, on the marketing side, um, we think a lot about our advertising spend. How can we automize and op automate and optimize and make the most of our advertising budget? On forecasting, which you'll hear a couple of talks about today, we think about both financial forecasting and demand planning. Uh, and then finally, the last couple of topics I want to cover. Um, we have some broad ML platform teams uh, whose work supports all of this, all of this great uh, applied efforts that, that we work on. Uh, this includes experimentation, uh, it includes computer vision. We have some really interesting computer vision applications, um, as well as we touch on a lot of areas of operational excellence. So things like preventing fraud, providing effective customer support. Uh, so I've showed a bunch of uh, a bunch of blog titles here. If you're interested in reading more about any of those or seeing more details on what we do, uh, you can check out our blog. Uh, the URL is very simple: doordash.engineering. Um, so having told you a bit about the team, let me move on and uh, make a quick plug here. We are, of course, hiring. Uh, always looking for great data science and machine learning folks. We have a range of roles uh, across the team. Uh, some particular things I want to call out that we're looking for experience in. Uh, deep learning, um, familiarity with two or three-sided marketplaces, um, looking at uh, folks who have experience at the intersection of operations research and ML, uh, familiarity with graph-based modeling techniques, and of course, search and recommendation systems. Uh, you can check out these opportunities on the team by going to our careers page. Uh, you can see the, the QR code here, as well as the URL, uh, careers.doordash.com. Uh, from there, you'll be able to, uh, uh, to go down and look at ML specific uh, opportunities. Um, so with that said, a uh, couple of quick things I wanna call out before we get into the talks. Uh, one, the, uh, the chat function in the Zoom call is disabled. Uh, so you won't be able to post questions there. Uh, if you do have questions, you should post those or submit them in the Q&A section you see at the bottom of the screen. And we'll be looking to get to those uh, towards the end of the, of, uh, of this seminar. Um, we will, however, we will also potentially be posting updates uh, from the team uh, in the chat section. So keep an eye open for announcements there. Um, so with all that said, I want to kick off our series of talks uh, and we're going to start off with Ryan who leads our forecasting team. Great, thanks Kurt. Uh, so as mentioned, um, I'll be talking about forecasting and specifically the work uh, the forecasting team at DoorDash is doing to build a central platform. To, to turbocharge our operations. 
So I'll be I'll be covering what the unique nature of forecasting and why we decided to to have a central team uh, focused on this and exactly what the benefits of having a central platform will be. Um, again, as opposed to the individual development. So moving into the first section on value of forecasting. Yep. So um, there's a, a really unique nature when it comes to, to forecasting versus other ML problems. So on the next slide, we can see how a lot of companies have been approaching it. Um, you know, even in this era of AI and ML, many companies are still using manual forecasting, and there's a, a number of reasons for that. Uh, two major ones are that often it's a small data problem, especially on the demand side or inventory management, where you have a daily series of observations. So you need multiple years before this even approaches something you can call big data. Also, it's has a number of, of challenges with outliers. Uh, the series are usually heavily seasonal. It's and very susceptible to, to any shift in demand pattern or anything that can disrupt that series. Uh, also, if you're trying to incorporate external features to help model these forward predictions, uh, you need to know the forward value of those features. So you might know that weather is related to demand, uh, but if you're trying to predict 12 weeks from now, what's the weather going to be? So you don't have readily available features to use and you need to make assumptions. Um, so any company that's heavily indexed on operational efficiency, which is most companies, but especially inventory management, logistics support, this is a critical issue. And it's starting to catch uh, the attention of uh, you know, a new frontier of analysis for in, in the data science community. And to the right, you see an article that McKinsey just published um, you know, calling out this problem as a, you know, widespread opportunity across uh, a range of companies. So moving into what we do at DoorDash, uh, this is an example of one system, one operational system here at DoorDash that uh, forecasting could improve. And this kind of highlights the complexity. So this would be to optimize uh, our support and quality function and you see uh, everything in blue would actually be a forecasting model that we depend on. So we, we need as part of this to optimize our supply demand to ensure we have good outcomes uh, across our marketplace. Then we need to deal with issues that pop up. So refunds, credits, uh, any support issue. Um, and then when, once those issues pop up, we need to uh, resolve them. So then we need to think about staffing support. We need to think about baking into our budgeting process, what our cancellation costs are gonna be, credits and refunds. And we need a handle on this um, you know, as we pace through the quarter and, and all of it depends on forecasting. So if these models were managed separately, you know, how would all these handoffs happen? In a lot of companies, it's passing Excel sheets forward. Um, and there's a lot of risk there because one, it takes a long time to create those manual inputs. And then if there's a missed handoff or the team that you're, you're hand, the next team you're handing off to has a different assumption, there's inconsistency. And by the time, even if there's one good forecasting model or one good input, by the time it gets to the end, it's either too late or it, it washes out. So you can see the different teams this hits here. So, you know, this system would require close coordination between supply demand, operational excellence, staffing, budgeting, CRM. So if these are all in different places, again, or using different methodologies, um, there's a high chance that it'll be a very inefficient system. So uh, articulating the benefits a little more, like if you have a better streamlined process, a defined pipeline that runs for each forecast, it's very quick. To, you can very quickly visualize, uh, select, ingest, validate these forecasts. Uh, that'll lead up to lead to freed up resources. So your operators should be spending time making decisions and reacting to what's happening on the ground, not just trying to come up with a view of, you know, the basic inputs. So that's one benefit that automated forecasting can provide. Um, the next one is more consistency. So if you have a single source of truth around holiday assumptions, outages, seasonality, and that reflects across all of your operations, then your PL will be a lot cleaner because you, you don't have conflicting assumptions um, and you can tell, you can articulate very clearly what's happening in the business and what challenges operations are facing 
and then bake in assumptions to PL. That frees up resources and also allows you to identify the critical areas that you might need to spend um, to improve. And then the final one, which is, should uh, seem like an obvious one, is better accuracy. So if you're manually constructing forecasts in Excel, you're calculating year over year, week over week, daily seasonality, again, it's, it's prone to human error at, as well as being time consuming. So accuracy will naturally lead to more efficient operational outcomes to help control costs, improve margins and, and profitability. So these were all you know, benefits that, that we pitched in this, uh, deciding to build this central platform. So moving forward. Um, Highlighting the common challenges and why you know, dedicated resources are, are needed for forecasting to make it scalable. So some of these things that create challenges are anomalous periods. Again, if you have a daily series, uh, COVID recently happening, large weather events like Texas snowstorm that happened um, a, a little over a year back, vendor migrations, all of these can lead to breaks in the time series, which would lead to kind of hard-coded models or hard-coded features needed, needing to be updated. So uh, that's where forecasting models and especially the system we built where we can rapidly control for each of these events comes, comes in handy and, and can uh, rapidly overcome anything that pops up. Product shifts. So if you make uh, a, a product decision, you may change your demand patterns or whatever you're, you're, you're trying to model with time series. So if you, for support, for example, Sometimes we make decisions to route uh, phone support to chat uh, to make it cheaper. But then if we need to forecast the number of phone tickets we're gonna get, we, we can't use a lot of the series or we need to de-emphasize a lot of the series. And that's hard to do again with hard-coded models in the moment outside of um, you know, a holistic toolkit. Outliers, so there's outages, there's one-time promotions, there's competitor behavior shifts that um, if a competitor runs a promotion, all of these need to be controlled for, and then demand shifts. So when there's stimulus checks or work from home patterns changing, all of these will change the inputs into your forecast. And if, if you don't have a mechanism to control for them will lead to, again, inefficient outcomes. So we'll run through some examples now on the following slides. So here, this is from the, the McKinsey article as well. Uh, so retail sales. Um, here, if there's a pattern of, of broken demand, that's gonna remain in the time series. And these are your inputs. So if you don't do anything to control for it, you don't smooth it, when you're calculating seasonality moving forward, you'll be averaging between the two periods and it'll produce either a flat forecast or you know, a forecast that, that doesn't have anything good to learn from and, and can show you know, highly volatile patterns. So even basic smoothing, uh, helps get you closer to the actuals. And a lot of uh, that's kind of the power of a lot of these forecasting models, getting the trend and the seasonality right. And then you can layer on other effects, which we'll get to later. So the next type of uh, event you need to control for is a product shift. So here on the left, you see uh, the actual series. And then you can see a couple different lines. The, the yellow line is controlling for outliers, but the green line and, and blue show how the actuals actually drift. So here we have a type of alert that we control for in support that's been trending down over time. So we try to correct for that with outlier detection, but also here, this is where the operate, having a close human in the loop relationship with the operator is so important uh, because there might be a good reason for either series to be valid. One, there could have just, there could have been an outage or a vendor migration. So there you want to to control for the outlier and use maybe the yellow line, which would lead to the brown series. Or you could be having a product ship where you're de-emphasizing these alerts and you may want a, a forecast that trends down over time. But that without that operational knowledge or uh, a way of selecting between the two, uh, you're, you're basically up to random chance for a data science model to get that right and make sense of that, that pattern because you need, there could be a very real reason for each. Um, and next slide. So demand shifts. So this is another one where the child tax credit is a good example. Um, you, we have order volume historical and you can see the historical order volume in blue. Uh, and you can see a bump uh, when on Wednesday when child tax credit hit. So if you don't do anything to control for that, uh, the algorithm will forecast this for every Wednesday in the future. So you need to, to be able to control for events like this. And, and again, it's if you need to 
update features for regular um, GBM or any any sort of model that's relying on external features, it'll be very time consuming to to implement. So you can either control for it through adjustments or or other mechanisms that we'll get through in the get to in the the later slides. And then outliers. So here you can see the impact on support of an outage. Uh, obviously, on the support side, if you have an outage, customers will need help and come in for support. So you can't uh, if you leave these in the series it'll produce uh, a highly unstable pattern moving forward. So smoothing events like this out is very key. The next. So when deciding to platform forecasting, build a central platform or staff individually, and then build or buy or use a vendor, there were some considerations we, we took into account. Um, for staffing individually, uh, we knew that if data scientists had to uh, control for all these events, that they would all be implementing individual ways of doing that if, if it was um, diffusely managed. So that we didn't find a universal package that existed out of the box. This redundant effort meant that one data scientist could only handle one or two forecasts. But with the central toolkit, we estimate that that could get up to 10 to 20 per data scientist you know, by the end of the year with the platform we're building. So that scale made the decision easy and um, made us decide that we would we would build that central platform. And then the other consideration, uh, build or buy, you know, we have a very build first approach given our engineering culture. We we evaluated external solutions, but there weren't any that had a complete feature set, especially when it comes to adjustments or modifying the forecast. Um, and a lot of them were tethered to one algorithm where we've realized that different algorithms will work for better for different series. So this would mean we'd have to spend resources supplementing whatever vendor uh, we went with. So we decided to build the entire solution in-house. So key differentiator, as I've mentioned a few times, is self-service or human in the loop. So running through that, that example with uh, the child tax credit. On the next slides. Well, what, first with Easter. So here for a holiday, um, if holiday, we, we noticed that holiday assumptions changed during COVID. And we might need to layer on top uh, external adjustments based on you know what analytics has sized. And here you can see you know what happens if we don't layer on a correction for holidays. Obviously, um, taking that adjustment into account made the forecast more accurate in this case. So applying a multiplier, being able to add subtract in, in real time based on um, operational or analytics knowledge is key. So next slide. Uh, for the child tax credit, again, the Wednesday example I, I ran through before, can quickly show the impact there as well. Uh, next slide. So here, the child child tax credit, September fifteenth, landed on Wednesday and led to elevated order volume. So here, we we sized relative to past Wednesdays, the week over week effect, and if we quickly run through the next slides, we can see the impact that made on the final forecast. We can keep progressing. So you can see, you know, backing that out was was key to getting demand or our demand forecast back in line with where it ended up. So next next slide, and differences of up to to fifty percent. So if you don't have a quick mechanism to do this, a lot of times companies just let it ride, and that leads to you know a, a big opportunity for efficiency. And next. So here, in order to create these adjustments, we created an easy API for operators uh, to layer in their knowledge. And that works uh, seamlessly with the forecast. Um, and I'll show the portal in the, the coming slides that operators can use. So next. So that's introducing Forecast Factory, our, our in-house platform. So it all starts from a centralized YAML config, where all, all you need is an SQL query that provides your, your series. And then a couple other parameters, is it weekly, daily, um, what's the target column, date column? And uh, our algorithm can already start producing forecasts out of the box that control for all of these different things. So it that kicks off a, a pipeline that runs automatically via Dagster. And in the context of the system, or the algorithm we'll show on the next slide. So this is what gets executed. 
So we have our own walk forward validation method. So since there's a time dependency here, you can't just do random splits of, of data. We then do any pre-processing to reduce um, the series down to current course and speed. So removing outages, removing holidays, removing undue weather impacts, et cetera, through a system of, of pre-processors we have. Then we let the algorithm forecast uh, the trend and in seasonality inherent in the data. And then we layer back on all of those effects. So holidays, um, any future promotions, future weather impact, uh, and that produces the final operational forecast. And all of these components can be swapped out uh, with different um, mechanisms. So different preprocessors, we have weather promotions, holidays, and, and that's completely extensible. Uh, we also, any algorithm can work here. So we have our own interface for you know, ETS, Holtz winners, um, profit. We have our own in-house Pegasus model developed by Chad. Um, and all of those can be swapped in in the moment. And if they if they require external features, that can be layered on at that step too. Um, then that allows, we're not tethered to one algorithm. We can pick and choose based on if it's ratio, if it's stationary, all of these different assumptions. And that's part of the system on the next slide. So here, this is the architecture around it. So we have our base ETL again, the pre-forecast code that runs for um, processing the series. And then we get a series of base forecasts. Operators can select adjustments to view as uh, alongside uh, the prediction selected by the model. And then we have some, some pre-populated candidates as well that they can select from. So limiting, for instance, the data to 28 days, uh, turning off holiday assumptions, having different smoothing assumptions, and, and that creates scenarios that we can swap to in the moment. And that's key if you notice something like a product shift or something like that, you don't have to rerun the model. All of these candidates, along with the, the adjustments, are, are there ready to, to select. If there's nothing wrong, you can use the, the forecast out of the box, but you have ready -made, um, the, a ready-made ability to, to remedy this through the UIs I'll, I'll touch on in the next slide. So we have an exploration one and an adjustment one, and then you know a final presentation uh, UI that goes out to the downstream partners. So here you can see, uh, this is the adjustment UI. So it's very simple. All you do is um, select an operand. You, you have, there's a very simple CSV format, and then you just drag and drop. You click upload adjustments. The forecasts are automatically adjusted and run with these in mind and displayed to the, the uh, operators. And then the next one is on the candidate. So here you can see all of these different assumptions. So. It, what happens if we reduce the training data to 28 days, 112 days, um, you know, whatever it might be? What happens if we dampen the trend, if we think um, the existing growth pattern isn't going to continue? Uh, all of these different options. So you can quickly see in the moment, um, and this is at a group level too. So you can select for each different submarket if it's grouped by market or whatever the unit might be. You can qu quickly filter to that element and correct the forecast. So here, even being able to visualize what's going on at that level is, is really helpful to understanding patterns, but then you can also remedy in the moment. And then for all those downstream handoffs, the, the tables are automatically updated and it's cascaded to the next partner. So it makes those handoffs a lot simpler too. And then, thank you. So yeah, that thanks for tuning in and, and learning more about the forecasting platform here. Please stay up to date on the engineering blog. Um, and we've got some great, um, uh, presentations to come, starting with uh, Chad, who is also on the forecasting team. We'll talk about how we use uh, causal inference. Uh, hello, my name is Chad. I'm working uh, at the forecasting team together with Ryan. Uh, in our uh, today's talk, I will talk about uh, how we use causal inference in order to improve the forecast accuracy at DoorDash. Uh, first, I will talk about macroeconomic factors and causal inference. And after that, I will present two case studies uh, that we actually experience in DoorDash and then conclude afterwards. Uh, first, I, will, uh, I want to uh, start with the macroeconomic factors. And first of all, I would like to discuss what I mean by a macroeconomic factor. Uh, a macroeconomic factor is a factor or an event that is affecting the whole economy. So uh, some examples of that are child tax credits, tax refunds, inflation, interest rates, and uh, also like uh, shelter in place orders, uh, orders. They are all macroeconomic factors. Uh, 
And why are we caring about those macroeconomic factors is that uh, because uh, our target series, the series that we are trying to forecast are generally respond to those macroeconomic factors. And if we cannot handle them, we are going to generate inaccurate forecasts. And most of the time, handling the macro factors is not easy. And actually, in our cases today, I am going to discuss some of those macro factors. I would like to just reiterate in this graph what I said in the previous slide is, uh, let's say that this uh, graph shows the number of orders in the submarket that we recently launched. And since it is a uh, new submarket, our order volume grows over time. But uh, during the, uh, like in the middle, we just receive a macro shot, which pushed the number of uh, orders up. And let's say that we want to generate a forecast uh, uh, on the day that the macro shock ends. And if we generate the forecast and then train our data by the historical data before that point, uh, what we are going to uh, get is like super high forecasts for the future because the model will think that there is a growth in trend and it will bake in, into the forecast. And uh, definitely, uh, when the actual goes back to normal, this creates a huge forecast inaccuracy. Uh, and uh, before going into the like the cases, I want to talk about a little bit about causal inference in the next slide. Uh, uh, first, I want to define the like the how uh, why we use co causal inference methods. Uh, we use causal inference methods in order to measure the impact coming from a single factor. And in our case, uh, it will be macroeconomic factors uh, because we want to measure the impact uh, coming from the macroeconomic factor per se, not the combined impact. Uh, when we look at the literature, there are some common methods used for the causal inference. Uh, I think the most famous one in the industry is random experiments. All tech companies, including DoorDash, they have large experimentation platforms, and then they are running hundreds and thousands of experiments each day. But sometimes it is not possible to run experiments, especially in the cases of macro shocks. So in those instances, we usually use other alternative methods such as difference and differences and synthetic controls. Uh, so the good thing about the causal methods is they help us to add an extra layer information into the uh, like process, which we cannot uh, do with just simple feature engineering. Uh, first, and now I will talk about our first case study, tax refunds. Uh, so we know that the IRS issues tax refunds around March and April. And then during, di uh, during that time period, we usually see a strength in the order volume of DoorDash because people are spending more money. But the problem is uh, measuring this impact. Uh, one idea that could come to mind is uh, just doing some simple feature engineering by using the amounts uh, deposited to the bank accounts by the IRS, but this is not enough. The reason is that let's say that I receive the money today, but I can spend it 10 days after or 15 days after that. So it is very hard to uh, get something meaningful by just simple feature engineering. In those instances, we add an extra layer of information. Uh, and in this case, our observation is that lower income zips are spending more money during tax refund period compared to the high income zips. In order to uh, uh, take this observation into the data, we are using the difference and difference specification that is actually defined by this equation. Uh, and by using this equation, we find the following, uh, we find the coefficients, uh, which is in the next slide. Uh, and as you see, uh, the coefficients uh, over time look like this in the graph. And then this actually gives a very good measure of the what is the impact coming from the tax refunds. And after, uh, by using the these coefficients, we can correct our series, pre-process, and then remove this effect from original series, and then generate the forecast, and which will give us more accurate forecast. Uh, 
In the next slide, I am explaining it uh, in by using the earlier graph that we showed. Uh, what we are doing is kind of simple. What we do is after calculating this impact, we remove the impact coming from the macro shock. So our uh, series looks better. And then when we generate forecast, now we generate much more accurate forecast than the previous case. And actually uh, from our experiences, we gain like 20, 30% relative improvement in the forecast accuracy from removing the macro events. In the next case study, I will talk about the daylight saving. Um, in, uh, uh, the, I think the daylight saving is a good example of if we have uh, concurrent factors, macro factors in the forecasting. Um, let's think of uh, like Halloween and daylight saving. Uh, uh, earlier in 2019 and 2020, we usually see a strength in the DoorDash order volume after the Halloween. But actually, uh, we discussed this and then we don't know whether this is kind of like a post Halloween impact or daylight savings impact because actually they are coinciding and they are exactly on the same week. And this turned out to be a problem when we are trying to generate forecasts in 2021, because since they overlap historically uh, in the same, uh, like in the earlier years, we actually don't know like what percentage of the strength comes from the Halloween and what percentage comes from the daylight saving. Again, in order to address this, we again try to add an extra layer of information. Uh, 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 in this case, our hypothesis is that uh, the locations that are closer to the western border of the uh, time zone uh, borders will uh, get darker earlier. And as they get darker earlier, people uh, get home earlier and then they will order from DoorDash. For instance, after the daylight saving and in November, the sunset in the Chicago is much earlier than the Indianapolis. So we would expect a higher positive in fact, in impact in Chicago compared to the Indianapolis uh, after the daylight saving. Uh, and by using this observation, uh, what we do is we divide our cities into two categories. The treatment cities are the cities that uh, just lie on the western, boy, uh, western side of the time zone border. And the control cities are the ones that lie on the eastern side of the border. And uh, by using uh, by using these groups, we again run a difference and differences as in the previous case. And we calculated the impact coming from the daylight saving. And so that we were able to use it in the forecasting. Uh, to conclude uh, in this like uh, presentation, we talk about like how we use causal inference in order to improve the forecast accuracy. Normally, causal inference is generally used for the uh, estimation. So looking at the impact coming from the promotions or other things in the experimentation. But this is kind of like a novel uh, approach using the causal inference. Uh, and we show we covered like two cases uh, of how we handle the macro factors. And we show that uh, it improves the forecast accuracy. Now Lou will talk about the uh, uh, merchant selection. Thank you, Chad. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to our technical meetup. My name is Lu Wang, and I'm from the DSML merchant team, mainly working on the merchant selection related work streams. So today I'm going to talk about the machine learning models that we built here to power our merchant selection strategies. Here are the contents I will cover today. Uh, first, I will talk about why we need to build these machine learning models to power our merchant selection strategies. And then I will talk about the workflows that we use to build, maintain, and uh, serve our machine learning models. Then I will illustrate the use case that how we make use of those outputs from our uh, machine learning systems. And finally, how we evaluate the business uh, values of our models to make sure it's actually optimizing our selection strategies. So why, we, why do we need to build machine learning models to power our uh, merchant selection strategy? 
DoorDash is not the first food delivery company in the industry, but now we have the largest market share in the US. That is because we constantly optimize our selection strategy to make sure that we can bring on the most valuable merchants to both DoorDash and our uh, customers. And uh, one big business problem here is that given the limited amount of resources and uh, the millions of off-platform restaurants, how can we allocate our resources and prioritize different merchants when we try to get them on board? So there are several questions that we need to answer um, before we set up our selection strategies. First is, how can we evaluate our total addressable market in any given region? And what's our current market share? So that we can improve our market share by bringing on more valuable merchants. Then for each one of the merchants, how can we understand their values to, to DoorDash and to our customers? What kind of characteristics make a restaurant a valuable addition to our platform? And also, um, what's our uh, current customer demand and the current uh, restaurant supply? Uh, and how we can determine what selection is missing and then we can go ahead and onboard merchants that offer this type of food. For example, if we notice that in a city, there are a lot of people searching for burger restaurants, but we don't offer enough burger choices in this region, then we probably need to prioritize the merchant, uh, the burger restaurants when we reach out to the merchants in that region. To answer these questions, we need to build a system that will allow us to first compare the merchants fairly at different time periods. Different merchants may have different time on DoorDash, some of those have been on DoorDash for say more than five years, but some of them are just brand new to DoorDash. How can we fairly compare those, their values to DoorDash? Uh, is one key questions we need to answer here. Uh, the second is that since we are fastly growing our business, we need to build these feature stores and models to support this cons con constantly expanding and also do fast iterations of different selection strategies. Finally, we will need a good way to validate and, and monitor the model performance to make sure that we are actually optimizing our selection strategy and bringing uh, the positive impact. So uh, next I will talk about the uh, selection model system workflow. Um, as you can see uh, on the next slide, uh, we, if you, uh, as you can see on the right-hand side, we collect the data resource sources from both internal and external vendors and build our uh, feature stores to support our models. After the data cleaning and uh, feature pre-processing, we will train these models and then generate those predictions. We refresh our models weekly and generate the predictions on a daily basis. After that, we will ingest the predictions as well as the model performance to our dashboard for future monitoring purposes, including uh, featured model and feature debugging and uh, uh, model performance monitoring, as well as like the feature importance and the uh, um, interpretation. So um, next I will talk about like how we train our, actually train our machine learning models to understand the merchant's value. First, Here's the timeline that we acquired merchants. First is that we, based on our model predictions, we uh, rank our merchants and prioritize the merchants. After we sign the contract with merchants, we help them to uh, get activated on DoorDash. And after some ramp up time, uh, their performance will be stabilized on DoorDash. So we fit a simple model to see uh, of their uh, monthly sales against uh, the, uh, their time on DoorDash to find uh, this appropriate time window when their performance gets stabilized. And then we use that time window to, to calculate our training labels. And then um, um, I will show you like the, how we generate uh, the feature stores uh, on the next slide. So you can see that uh, the features, there are many different segments of features. First is a search and request um, from the customers, basically how many customers search for certain restaurants. It will capture the train and the need from the customers. Also um, for the restaurants, we collect their public reviews and ratings as well as what kind of food they serve um, um, for each one of the off-platform merchants. 
when we also consider their say their interactions with uh, DoorDash as well as their business sizes, and also the timing that we go ahead and reach out to the merchants. And finally, it's the sales and the tra site traffic related features in the similar geo locations. And uh, um, so for different cohort, we look at like the business size and the DoorDash inter their interactions with DoorDash. So the merchants are uh, different. First is that are they new to DoorDash or they are just the labs partners? We have some kind of historical uh, on-platform data for the merchants. And the second is that, is that a um, chain store merchants or that is just the local brick and mortar restaurants? And also now you can only, um, you can not only order food deliveries from DoorDash, you can also like the uh, buy grocery, pet supplies and flowers uh, from DoorDash. So we build different models for different verticals because uh, for different cohorts, uh, the merchants will have different performance. So after gener we generate those features and the uh, uh, labels, um, here's the output. Next, I will talk about the, our, our output and downstream applications of our uh, system. So uh, the output is that, as you can see here, first we, for each one of the merchants, we will predict their success value. And then we will assign a rank for each one of the merchants within a certain region. And then we can allocate the, uh, the merchant to our sales reps based on those ranks. We can also, cal we also calculate our sales compensations based on those predicting, predictive values. Um, and the, uh, the goals, uh, goal, goaling of the cross-functional partners may also refer to these predictive values. So after this application, how can we actually evaluate the performance of the models? We use the two major metrics to evaluate the model performance. First one is the uh, weighted decile cohort percentage error. Uh, this is how accurately we are actually predicting the, their success value. And the second one is because we will need to uh, calculate the market share based on those absolute predictions. And then we'll also look at the decile rank scores. Uh, that is an indicator of how accurately we are ranking the merchants. So uh, if you want to know more details, you can refer to the, our uh, inch blog post. And here is just a simple illustration of like how we calculate the scores. Basically, we calculate the difference between the, their predicted decile rank as well as the actual decile rank. And then finally calcul calculate the weighted scores because we want to prioritize, we need to prioritize the merchants with higher uh, decile ranks. And so, um, that is how we, um, evaluate our model performance. So uh, to conclude, we build a set of uh, machine learning models to be predict this merchant value to DoorDash based on both internal and external data. And we cons constantly explore for useful data resources that can inform the merchant values. And this system is designed to be scalable and flexible to, accom to accommodate uh, DoorDash's expansion. I also illustrated one uh, use case here, that is how we support uh, the merchant ranking and allocate the sales reps. Finally, this system is not only valuable to off-platform merchants, it, is, it can also identify the key success factors to on-platform merchants so we can help them to grow and to be successful. So next, Shi will talk about the image recognition uh, models here at DoorDash. Thank you, Lu. Oh, hey everyone, uh, I'm Chi. I've been at DoorDash for uh, two and a half years. I'm a data scientist working for ETA slash assignment problems mainly. Um, I was also uh, actively involved in the very first few image related use cases. So which will be uh, today's topic. Uh, next please. So a quick agenda. So I want to talk about what kind of opportunities do we have here at DoorDash um, and what type different types of photo data that we have and can help DoorDash to automate our business practice. And before we dive into the technical solutions, I also want to share a little bit what kind of technical challenges we are facing here uh, in order to those, uh, use those image photo, uh, photo data. And then um, what is our solution and what is our vision of uh, the future of the image recognition workstream? Next, please. 
So first, what opportunities with image data? So um, as you may know, DoorDash actually has very rich data sets. And part of this data set is actually photo related um, data. So for example, in our contactless flow during pandemic, uh, consumer may request Dasher just to leave the order in their front door without uh, seeing each other. So those qualified drop off photos can confirm lots of uh, confirmed deliveries and with very rich information. So for example, when a dasher take a photo, uh, it may include the door and it include the um, like house number. And from the image metadata, we can also retrieve uh, what is the delivery time or the time the photo was taken and what is the consumer location means latitude and longitude. Another example is when dasher arrive at a store and find the store is closed, they can actually take a photo and send it back to Dota to say our uh, store is closed. Um, and then that can sign some that sign can confirm the canceled deliveries. And from Dota's side, we will pay the dasher a certain amount of delivery fee because this is not the, uh, the dasher's fault. Um, some others are like when Dasher want to deliver the pizza and uh, pizza order, uh, they need to send us a photo to prove they actually have um, qualified pizza bag. Uh, with that, we will try to assign um, pizza orders to to Dasher who has um, the satisfied equipment so that we want to make sure when pizza order is delivered it is still warm and delicious. Next, please. Uh, uh, as mentioned, like there are lots of opportunities and touching different aspects in uh, DoorDash business. Um, but those business uh, problems actually have pretty high uh, technical requirements. So the first challenge we are facing is low latency or latency issue. So for example, in the uh, drop of photo use case, we actually having millions of images daily. And those images, because they contain some consumer sensitive data, they will be expired within a few, hour, a few like hours or days. So it means whatever model or solution we're trying to build here, it needs to be fast enough so that we can retrieve in critical information from the image before it expires. And in some other use cases, uh, that actually requires near time or near real time uh, prediction. So for example, uh, when Dasher report store is closed uh, and we need to make a decision if this is true or not, and then pay the Dasher half of the delivery fee. So in that sense, uh, the model or solution needs to be near real time so that we can send back our decision-making to um, the Dasher fast enough. Uh, the second one is ground truth availability. So first of all, it is actually uh, very difficult for us to label all the images given the large volume of data we are receiving daily. And also the another challenge is different use cases may have very different domain knowledge. So what kind of label is useful? That is um, another question we need to answer here. And last but not least, uh, we want the model or the solution to be fast developed so that the model can be, we can try the solution and find out if there's a true business impact here. Uh, next please. Um, and some of the technical solutions. So uh, next, please. Okay. So I will use the uh, drop of image recognition as one example about how we build an image recognition platform. So in this use case, uh, the question or problem we try to solve is if we can identify an image with a qualified dot object, and then we can use the associated latitude and longitude information as uh, to locate the consumer pins. So uh, the business, the, the problem we're trying to answer here is actually because Google Map or Apple Map, which are the third party navigation uh, apps we are relying on, they don't provide us with very accurate consumer pin, especially for consumers who is living in, uh, say, a very the multi-unit complex. Uh, next, please. So first, uh, when we are clear about what we want to achieve, uh, we manually label our images. So on the left hand side, those are the images labeled as good. So you can see it actually contains the very proper door objects. And on the right hand side, it is labeled as bad because those images are not like taken in front of the consumer door. We actually, given the very limited resources, our engineers and data scientists, we manually labeled around a few K images and then started from there. Next, please. Um, as you can imagine, it is image or computer vision related use, uh, use case. So naturally we choose convolutional neural networks. I will skip some of the low level details. It's a pretty standard with input layer, convolutional layer. Um, and because we are trying to have a classification model then soft, software max uh, is needed to output uh, the probability. Next please. 
Um, we choose ResNet as our backbone network and leverage this pre-trained model. Uh, and we do very do a very extensive uh, hyperparameter tuning. So for example, learning rate, momentum, decay, et cetera. Um, and the output of our model is a point prediction, which is the uh, label, good or bad, and associated with a confidence score, which is a probability. Um, next, please. So why we chose ResNet? Uh, before we tried to build a model, we actually carefully compared different solutions um, because we have this latency requirement. So we want the model to be accurate enough uh, and at the same time can fulfill our uh, SLO. Uh, and end up we choose uh, ResNet. Next, please. Um, and in terms of model serving, when we have the model being built, um, for this specific use case, there's no requirement of real-time prediction. So we, we leverage our daily ETL uh, pipeline. So every day we grab all the images uh, we received in the last in uh, yesterday and load it into the model and to do the model survey and try to predict uh, the label, good or bad, and the probability for each image. And then uh, those image or those information will be uh, written into a database and used by the downstream services. Next, please. Um, and we also do a lot of optimization uh, because as you can see, uh, we want to parallelize to improve the efficiency of our model serving. So, because we want to process around 2 million images daily and uh, we leverage GPU uh, clusters and we also do a lot of uh, data loading parallelization as well, uh, leveraging PyTorch and Spark. And before the optimization, uh, we can actually process around 50K images within three hours and after optimization, we can successfully create uh, process around one, 1 1.2 images within one and a half hour. Next, please. So just a recap a little. So our solution is when we build the model offline, we first collect historical data and manually labeled some of the, a good decent amount of the data and then build the deep learning model. And then we evaluate model offline to make sure uh, the model accuracy satisfies. And then in the model serving, uh, we grab the all the images uh, from yesterday and then do some pre-processing and then model serving and finally write the result to downstream services. Next, please. Uh, about next steps. Um, next, please. So for sure, we're not satisfied with what we have achieved here. So we want to improve for each steps uh, in our pipeline. So first about the image or uh, annotation. So now we are relying on an in-house manual on annotation, um, but we are also actively talking with some third-party vendors so uh, to in order to see if we can have more labeled data feeding into our model. And besides of that, we know our model has a pretty good uh, or decent performance. So we want to automate the data labeling by using the model to predict uh, the images. And then when the prediction has a high confidence score, and then we can feed back those labels, uh, feed those labels back into our model to let it self-improve. Um, and then for the model training, uh, also like we're not only satisfied with the classification model, we are thinking about uh, to output the boundary box, et cetera. And for deployment, uh, currently we are building a new service called image service, which will host all our image related models um, and also associated information. So for example, given a prediction, a predicted label for an image, what is the store ID? What is the dasher ID? What is, how long does the dasher wait at a store? So on and so forth. Um, yeah, so uh, th that's pretty much uh, all I want to share today. So I feel, personally, I feel very excited about this, um, all the image related work streams. This is still pretty new and the green fields for DoorDash, but it has been proved to successfully launch at least three um, business use cases um, and generate a lot of values for the business. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Chi. Uh, thanks to uh, all of our other speakers, uh, Lou, Chad, and Ryan. Uh, lots of really exciting work and a kind of a diverse range of uh, ML topics we covered. Hope that was uh, informative to everybody and gave you all a good feel for the the breadth of things that we're working on at DoorDash. Uh, so I'm gonna use the rest of the time. I know we're just coming up on the hour here, uh, but we did promise you all some time for Q&A. So I'm gonna ask a couple of questions uh, that we got during the talks. Um, I'll see how many folks uh, stick around in the participants. And if there are still a lot of folks, we can we can run a few minutes over uh, to get to some more of these questions. So let me jump right into things. Uh, first one I wanna ask, uh, this comes from Sarim. Uh, 
This is, I think, a forecasting question. Uh, they asked when a break happens, how do we account for that? Do we train the model after excluding anomalous data? And I think, uh, Ryan, are you going to field this one? Yep. Uh, yep, ready to answer. So good question. So if it's our, our process is if it's something we've observed before and we know is going to repeat, then we will come up with one of those processors to handle it. And if we know it's going to happen in that series, say a product change in for support, it happens all the time, we adjust our policy. We have a ready made uh, kind of playbook that that will populate alternative models that we can then select that are pre populated. Um, so for instance, one is like the 28 day look back window, we call it only using 28 days of data. If we completely blow up the history by making a product change, we need to rapidly retrain. And you can, that should be a one click thing that we can use in situations like that. Now, if it's something completely different, um, like a, a highly unique promotion or a new stimulus or uh, something like that, then we may need to come up with a custom uh, process and retrain the model. But the, and the, goal is to have as many scenarios available in advance so we don't have to constantly retrain and we do have the ability to only retrain for the the markets or the individual units or series that are affected great all right thanks ryan uh our next question and i think this is also about forecasting uh comes from rachel uh she asks what does your weekly process look like for identifying outliers and how much time is spent each week Yep. This is also something we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to minimize the effort for. So we have proactive alerts that can uh, fire in Slack if the series changes by too much week over week. And that will guide you only to the specific series where there might be an issue with an outlier um, or or have an issue that that popped up. So we also tune our thresholds specifically for each series to um, flag only events that do affect the series and aren't normal. Um, seasonality. So our thresholds will learn over time and you, you'll get a Slack notification keying you to exactly uh, what that series is. So, and again, we have different ready-made processors. So then if you identify an outlier, there should be three or four different options to control for it that you can see which one works best. And it should just be a button quick button click to switch to that pre-populated option. Great. All right. Thanks, Ryan. Um... Let me go through uh, some more. Um, we've got a lot of questions here. Uh, I think this one might, um, yeah, I'll just go through a couple more. Um, let's see. Um, one more we had, uh, I, think, I think this might be a good question for chat if I'm reading this right. Um, uh, Sheetal says, I'm interested in knowing if DoorDash handles these special events like holidays, promotions, or other exogenous reasons with a separate forecasting model or are these manually adjusted for the period? Who is, uh, uh, who is the uh, person asking the question? Just to see. Hey, Chad, uh, th this was a question from Shital. I will post it uh, so you can it's, see it in our, okay. in our panelist it's chat. Perfect. Okay, that's good. Um, I think for the holidays, uh, like the promotion, sometimes we do feature engineering, but also like we have other methods. For instance, for holidays, we can look at like how the like the previous holidays, uh, how our data behaved in our previous holidays. For instance, we have a decrease in the Thanksgiving, like 30 percent. Then we are going to take it into the like the future years as well. So we are not using a separate forecasting model, but we are just like handling it within the same forecasting model. Great. Uh, and we are not right. manually adjusting. So we are we have like an automated process for doing that. Yep. And then one piggyback is if we know a certain model works better during holiday periods, we can always cut over when we're locking the forecast with an upcoming holiday period, especially like you know Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's. Uh, that time is always unique. Great. All right, thanks, Chad and Ryan. Uh, I'm gonna do uh, cover one more question. Uh, Chi, I, I see you're typing the answer right now, but why don't we go to cover this live? Uh, so Sareem asks, how do we? Uh, oops, sorry, I think I just uh, one second. I think I just lost it. Here we go. Um, how do? We, well, I okay, it's just. Just disappeared on my screen, but I think the gist of the question was, 
how do we decide when, when to use a pre-trained model uh, versus when to, to retrain something ourselves? Yeah, sure. So we mainly decide that by uh, model performance. Say if we see it has a higher accuracy and then uh, we will choose that strategy. And then the good thing about the pre-trained is not only um, uh, accuracy, we actually find it satisfied uh, our requirements, but also it will speed up our development uh, way faster than self-development and you, something from scratch. Great. All right. Thanks for that. Um, well, I see we've just gone a, a few minutes over. I know we've got a ton of questions. Would love to stay and answer more of those. Um, but uh, I think we're just hitting time. Uh, I know the, the panelists were also gracious enough to answer some of these uh, in the Q and A section uh, in in Zoom. Um, so I uh, just want to wrap things up. And once again, uh, thanks to our panelists for taking the time to tell us uh, more about their work. And thanks to you all for joining and for your interest in learning about ML at DoorDash. Uh, I know that Ezra has added a couple couple links in the chat for folks to follow up if you wanna learn more. Uh, you can both visit our career page to see uh, opportunities uh, to join us at, at DoorDash, uh, as well as I believe we should have some links uh, from our uh, to our blog where you can dive into even more details about some of the work that we're doing. Uh, thanks again, everybody for joining us today.